Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversants are Mia Ashton and Eliza Mondegreen. They've both been on my channel before to speak about their research into the gender issue. Mia Ashton works for the Post Millennial right now, reporting on this almost daily, I believe. And Eliza Mondegreen is working on a master's degree and taking a sociological logical stance to the spread of the ideas of gender that are so shaping modern discourse. And in this conversation, they share their research and their stories together. We talk about the WPATH or World Professional Organization for Transgender Health conference that they both attended that I covered previously with Eliza, but we get more into the psychology of the doctors and professionals that are pushing child transition specifically. They are wonderful to speak to. And without further ado, here's Mia Ashton and Eliza Mondegreen. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So how's the sound? First of all, you have a beautiful voice. So don't, safe. don't tell her that on camera because I told, I, I said that and I got, I got a lot of trouble for complimenting. What? You don't think I, I think could say that? I could probably say that. Yeah. Women can compliment each other. You have a beautiful voice. Thank you. I've, I'm told. I'm told it's delectable. <laughs> they, they were so upset. Okay, I got so Benjamin many messages said on camera. Was that that was it. delectable? It was delectable. Okay. Listen how listen to how she says delectable though. Delectable. Every single. <laughs> yeah. Every single little. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Okay. Shall, right. Shall we do it? Mia and Eliza to northbound turfs uh what would you guys describe yourselves as you're both above that parallel there's some parallel and you're above it yeah we're the expat turfs i think oh yeah yeah and eliza are, what general area of the united states are, are you from i was from the upper midwest okay right you're like gonna have farm, to pin that pin that down more for me farm country um, okay. I'm from Wisconsin. Cheese. Yeah. Did your did your family do any farming? Or are you a few generations removed from that? Nope. Um, my my mom's came from a farm family, but not from Wisconsin. And um, my dad came from like the longest line of longest continuous line of pastors in like human history. So pastors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Is he a pastor yeah. himself? Yes. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. You're the first generation to like break the, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, we are both in Canada. Canada had to import some turfs. Even things out a little bit. Yeah. Mia's being vague again. <laughs> I'm being vague. <laughs> I'm going to be really awkward, aren't I? I no. Are you waiting for no. my input, how I ended up in Canada? I think we already oh, covered yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. yeah, explain to... Did we? Yeah, we probably covered it. A bit. I um, Yeah, I married a Canadian. I, I, I met a Canadian in Taiwan, of all places. And it, it's rather romantic. He... Um, he saved me from a, a cockroach. A large cockroach had flown in and was attacking me, and he saved me from the cockroach. and And I ended up marrying him and having his children. <laughs> Man, even though you're a turf, you can't get away from the men saving women trope. It just it's it's a constant. Oh isn't? yeah. <laughs> I did the cockroaches. I don't do well. I don't do well with uh, bugs of any kind. But the cockroaches in Taiwan were brutal. They would go straight for you, no fear whatsoever. They would aim for you, and they fly. Of course, I'm I'm talking a flying one that flew in and landed on me. What did What did it want from you? Just attention. Your clothing. To run all over me. Oh, so the, the did memory. you have an energy bar in your hand? No, nothing, nothing at all. They just go for you. Oh wow! Okay. What well, were? Why were you in tai, Taiwan though? Teaching English. Okay. I moved there after university. I had no idea what to do, and so a friend and I moved out there. 
I ended up staying there almost a decade. I went for a year oh, and wow. I stayed almost a decade. Do you miss Not it? Got married and had my first child there. Yeah, I miss it all the time. Loved Taiwan. What do you think about it? It's, it was, it's a beautiful, well, okay, it's a beautiful country that is it, very densely populated, but I'm, I love mountains and I lived right at the foot of a, a beautiful mountain range. So we had scooters, we would drive our scooters up into the mountains and the food is incredible. The people are just wonderful, kind, generous, lovely people. It was, I don't know, I... I think about it all the time. It's been a long time, 12 years since I left, and I still think about it. Mm. And I guess it's just, is it, I, it's, it's an island, densely populated, so it's just a big city that you know, just swallows half the island kind of thing. And... Yeah, it's, so it's a really, I think it's 600 kilometers from, from top to bottom, and it's very narrow. And the, the middle is mountains, it's all mountains. And then the east coast is battered by typhoons each year, so less populated. So there's about 20 million people concentrated on a tiny west coast. But it's got, I think it's, it's sort of... Uh, it's like it, it preserved all of Chinese culture because everything that the Cultural Revolution destroyed, the traditions and the religions, mm -hmm. they all they're all there on Taiwan, and they're all thriving, and it's very colorful and it's a very special place. Hmm. Isn't it kind of claustrophobic? I get used to that. It's definitely the, the density can get to you, especially driving, you know, on scooters with masses of people on scooters around you. So, you no, know, it can be you feel the population density and, and pollution is an issue, of course. I lived there for about three months before I even saw the mountains oh that were right there. I remember waking up one morning and it had rained and there's this gorgeous <gasps> mountain range outside my window. So pollution's an issue. Hmm. Eliza, what's the most exotic place that you've lived? Canada. <laughs> is it as densely populated as you hoped? No, no. The real answer is um, San, like Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area. For for college or something. I worked there for a while, and it was that was a different kind of culture shock experience. I would say. It's it's interesting to be like surrounded by a bunch of people who are like technically your peers and yet you have like no shared experiences and no shared like frame of reference in the world. And it's actually been very instructive for trying to understand um kind of what we're going through culturally right now, but it was it was a strange place. What was uh Discord that's an interesting uh point of view that you're bringing. But there was this um, not shared frame of reference. So were you kind of, were they super so-called woke or just? Yeah. I mean, they were very, like, that was the first time that I ran into people taking things that I had learned in like college seminars seriously, like taking it pretty literally. Um, I didn't actually know that people did that. They really like quinoa. Oh yeah, of course. It's good for the environment. Or your digestion, right. or both. There are a lot of people there who think that cauliflowers could be steaks. Like it's a weird, it's a weird place. <laughs> <laughs> and how does that help you understand what's going on in the culture, or specifically if you want to get into the gender? Or are you thinking just more broadly? There's this clash of cultures going on. I mean, it's a clash of value systems. This isn't really something that I thought about before our interview, but um, it's I don't know. It's like one of the early examples that I had was like my first job out of college. I was like relentlessly sexually harassed by my boss and he uh, and it was much worse for my even younger colleague. Like, so I was 20, 
22 and she was about 19 and like it was very like it would have been a little much for like mad men you know <laughs> the tv show um and then we moved to i moved to california and like our entire nonprofit melted down for a month over something that like should not have happened but was not anywhere on that level and it was just it, and and everything was kind of like that like there was a point in which the executive director's dog bit like three people in the office and then everybody had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with hr about how they felt about the dog being in the office and people said we feel bad about the vegan dog biting people like maybe it should eat real food maybe it shouldn't come to the office um and then we had like a meeting where the executive director said that we were a family and that the dog was also part of the family so the dog would keep coming to the office <laughs> There's a vegan dog that, I mean, that just makes the story perfect. <laughs> and it's eating the dog. humans, but the, the humans <laughs> are like all progressive. Like so they're like, oh, I feel bad, but he needs some meat. So I guess it's my leg. You're going to share it, you know, be inclusive here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Have you guys, um, so just for the sake of, uh, the audience and, and for the sake of context from my point of view, like when did you both kind of arrive into doing this work, covering this work? Like how long have you guys been looking at the gender issue and thinking about it and dealing with it and speaking about it too? I'll go first. Uh, for me, it's uh, since 20, well, I know exactly. We talked about this last time. The day of the JK Rowling tweet okay. was my, I think um, Andrew Doyle calls it an identity quake. And I hmm. think that's a perfect term. It's, I, the, uh, there were, there were definitely signs that I wasn't fully woke. I was one of those, like most people, just going along with it. Mm -hmm. Where's the harm? trans women are women, I don't really believe it, but sure, why not? You know, I couldn't really see any harm with it. And then the JK Rowling tweet, I saw it and I saw, I saw the reaction to it and the reaction did not make any sense to me at all. And then in my Facebook world, I saw people that I know and respect also reacting in the same way to it. And that made no sense either. And I, at that time, weighed in and said, I, I don't really understand the the issue here. And I got, it was a sort of my first pile on, I suppose it was, it was small. It was my community of people. Mm -hmm. Someone shared that uh, wonderful, ironically named, um, stop using phony science to justify your transphobia. You know, that scientific American article, I, that was the first mm -hmm. time I'd seen that and nothing made any sense. So I, I plunged into the issue as you do and just you, you there's no coming back from that once you're in you'll never be the same again and so but it was very it was minimal i think i can safely say this now that i had a twitter account at the time that i no longer have um it was just you know tweets nothing serious until my mm -hmm. second twitter account i think getting suspended from twitter changed things for me because i actually had a one month period where i had no twitter and i started reading more and then looking into it more twitter wasn't sucking all my time and then when <laughs> i came back <laughs> i had a different twitter approach and i started to write threads and more sort of less more serious research and that's how i ended up the post millennial offered me a full-time position writing covering the gender issue for them so uh december 19th 2019 i believe is when that mm -hmm. jk rowling tweet went live mm -hmm. um and so over the course of the last what 22 i guess about three years now yeah, we're coming up on three years. That's or right. Four, yeah, three years. So, uh, and Eliza, when, when did you enter, and what was your? I know we we probably already talked about this, but yeah, we did talk about it a little bit. But um, I mean, I first, I was definitely like curious and felt like there was something going on there around 2013. It was just starting to like nose into my social circles, but I didn't really look into it until. Um, 2016, 2017. And I started writing publicly about it in early 2019. 
mostly on Twitter. And so I'd like to see where you guys overlap, but what have you been mapping? You guys can just popcorn style. Like what? what's the lay of the gender land that you guys have kind of been able to map out? Broadly speaking, or in particular, what what little kind of things well, are you guys well, talking to? I've I've noticed. You see, we didn't really start talking in the DMs until the mm -hmm. W Path situation, but we've no we've known each other in the Twitter world for. Uh, you knew me on my last account too. You probably don't know who that was, but I've noticed that we were both reading the same. Yeah all of the same books but yeah. separately so yeah. um, the i think you share my fascination with uh, multiple personality disorder I epidemic do. um share a love of ian hacking and just sort of past scandals past social contagions and and learning about them and how they fit with now has been mm -hmm. my thing and i and i i've noticed you have a similar interest there too yeah I, it's interesting because i've thought about like we are maybe two we're maybe the some of the most similar accounts on gender critical twitter because of that interest in medical history and like kind of long threads and breaking things down um but yeah we were both reading about uh the history of pediatric endocrinology and their great love of like mm -hmm. miracle working where you start with an actual miracle which is insulin that brings kids back from the brink of death and then you know, a couple of decades later, you find yourself trying to manipulate the height of tall girls and short boys. Um, I think we were both looking into like reading all about ADHD and like childhood bipolar disorder and just all of these, um, all of these like, how something moves from kind of a pharmaceutical discovery to a prescribing fad to an identity to a social movement like wherever that happens how does that happen and um and, and just watching over time that movement from a diagnosis to an identity to a movement getting stronger and stronger until we see it with gender where it seems like it's really arrived so in what you're indicating is that gender is the culmination of uh, a process of medicalization and socialization like this confluence and, and gender itself has all the different aspects plus a bunch of academic backing uh, so and... i like i do think that that's also happening but what i'm actually talking about is like you can see pharmaceutical companies find a drug oh it does these things oh what can we use it for and then they sell the diagnosis to sell the drug. They create this new category of people who fit the diagnosis. Um, that, diagnos that diagnosis will be even more effective if it becomes an identity. It'll be even more insulated from criticism. So something that would be an example of that would be some multiple personality for sure is something where we see it become... That, that, that one's interesting because that's not a drug so much. I guess they use them during treatment, but... That's a diagnosis that becomes an identity and a social movement. Um, and then if you question multiple personality, if you question recovered memory, if you question all of the things like the therapeutic techniques that were connected with it, it was like you were doubting people's identities, multiples. It, it just sounds exactly like what we have now where you're doubting a person's trans identity. Um, but even something like to, to bring a drug related example back into it, like Bipolar disorder is marketed as an identity in the 90s. Uh, you know, they connect it to all of these forms of genius. They go back and raid the past and they're like, you know, Fitz and Van Gogh and Virginia Woolf and all of these like brilliant people were bipolar. Like you might, if you're like an exceptionally gifted person who isn't living up to your potential, you're probably bipolar too. They make it this really attractive package to sell a lot of drugs, Which is like all daily a lifetime. It's all done in in the attempt, well, I'd like to think in a sort of well-meaning attempt to reduce stigma, though, isn't it? If you're making it into an identity, you're somehow not mentally ill and, and mm -hmm. you're special instead. Um, I think with the multiple personality, it's very similar in that 
if you didn't believe these women and their identities, not only did you not believe in in the, what they were saying, but you were also labeled as supporting child abuse, basically, or, or being yes. you, you were you were kind of supportive of pedophilia and child abuse, and you were a terrible person. It's it's very like now people didn't want to challenge it not only because it was attacking someone's core identity, but also because it made them out to be, they made them out to be awful people for doing so, mm -hmm. which is like now, of course. What was the drug prescribed for childhood borderline personality disorder? So lithium um, or something like that? So for child bipolar disorder, it would have been that new class of, there are atypical antipsychotics right in the end. I don't, this, you see, I haven't looked into childhood okay. bipolar. I, I was, I know I've been in conversations about ADHD, mm -hmm. um, that, that whole, it's an epidemic, right? And it's simply, to me, it's the medicalization of normality. We just take normal human conditions. We turn them into a diagnosis and then we medicalize them. What, what's ADHD really? I mean, maybe, maybe some people actually truly have something that benefits from being medicalized, but I think a lot of children, they're just children. Oh, oh, there's a wonderful, have you ever come across this? It was a Canadian study in 2011, I think, where they looked at a million Canadian children and the diagnoses that they had received in the past 12 months. And then they charted ADHD and the, the it was a straight diagonal line from January mm. to December. So the later in the year that the child was born, the so greater chance they had of being diagnosed with ADHD. And the explanation is simple. It's just um, teachers would be the ones to alert the parents to the problem. And so the cutoff in, in Canada is December 31st. Uh, you can have a child born in January and you can have a child born in December in the same class. So all they were doing was medicalizing their immaturity. They were not at the same developmental stage. And that was considered a medical condition. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I, and again, the, I'm always drawing parallels because if you're just looking, looking at a checklist in the DSM and mm -hmm. you're not looking at the context of a child's life or a person's life, where these symptoms may have come from, you're going to medicalize something that is just a normal human response. And these kids showing up at gender clinics, if you just look at the DSM diagnose, the, the DSM mm -hmm. checklist for gender dysphoria, and you don't look at Maybe they've been bullied. Maybe they've experienced trauma. Maybe they're dealing with a, an emerging homosexual orientation. All of the things that you could, or if, you, if they've been in a rabbit hole on, online and absorbed in trans culture, if you don't look at any of that, you can medicalize, you can diagnose them with something that they don't have. Mm -hmm. So studying these fads, these trends, and the steps, thanks for putting it out in the way that it develops. It, it seems like there's a curve to it where, where it peaks out, these fads peak out, and then they kind of ebb and go away and, and are forgotten, right? So what are, what are some of the, the signs? You know, because everybody's like, oh, we're peaking now, we're peaking now. The New York Times wrote three sentences that was... For, for years. Slightly, yeah. So, so what are what are some of the signs when it when it's at its full power and when it when something like this starts to crumble? Have you guys seen patterns in that in studying these different movements? I mean, the lawsuits are a pattern, and the thing is, like, the lawsuits will hit. The claims about malpractice will come out. The reporting will shift from it's really great to, well, maybe there's some questions about it. And I think that we are seeing that with gender, but just looking historically, it's not like this kind of idea, once it's introduced into a culture, whether it's introduced into like the field of medicine really goes away. Like it kind of goes out of fashion and adherents remain and patients attach to that explanation or diagnosis. Um, 
so multiple personality like it went out of fashion it became kind of like you know uncool or suspicious to talk about it we'd be like oh maybe this person is a crank but it's you know it has survived to now kind of be making a resurgence um through online social media communities it never really it never really went away hmm. yeah the the concept trans kid is so powerful that mm -hmm. it's another level like i don't remember in the 90s or the 80s whenever the satanic panic going on people wearing branding themselves wearing t-shirts protect satanically ritualized children or something like that right well but no but they had they had their slogan you see i love the satanic panic as well it's such a great well, it's not oh, great yeah. but it's but fascinating to study we believe the children they would march in the streets with their signs we believe the yeah. children you you the, it was exactly like now in the sense that you had to you you had to be behind it if you didn't again you supported ritual you abuse you, you were, you were suspected were. exactly there, there was the 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 learning report the the fbi mm -hmm. agent who was tasked to investigate the whole panic and when he came out with the report that there is not one shred of evidence to support any of this so therefore it's not happening they accused him of being in a a part of this whole international satanic ritual cult mm -hmm. no they did they had their slogans they perhaps didn't you know we didn't have the social media at the time with the t-shirts and the hashtags but they very much had the you must you had to believe the children and what the children were saying was was so far out there and so so completely outrageous i i, I read about um in North Carolina, a group of children had said that they were thrown from a boat to a school of sharks, and they somehow lived to tell the tale. And then, but then in in the McMartin, the most famous, at one point, one of them, I think he said Chuck Norris was in the cult. And at that point, they drew the line. Okay, we'll believe you were thrown to a school of sharks, but there's no way we're letting you implicate Chuck Morris, Chuck Norris here. <laughs> 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 but you had to believe them yeah. there's um there's also a parallel with the QAnon um conspiracy group or uh, it's not really a group it's just this uh kind of feeding frenzy on uh, information and there's that satanic thing going and that pedophile mm -hmm. satanic thing going on and then it's projected onto the elite and the elite are kind of suspicious too i mean with epstein being epstein and so on and so forth and yeah maxwell like getting accused of uh, getting prosecuted for child trafficking but we don't know who she trafficked to and we're not allowed to ask that right so th there's uh you know there, there's reasons why you would suppose that there's that going on but that from the left-ish point of view that satanic thing is just beyond the pale it's just beyond the these people are a bunch of crazies you know uh, y youtube actually gave me a strike for speaking with somebody who was a QAnon person, right? I got a little trouble because it was online harassment for some reason, I guess, you know, oh, you know poke, okay. poke it's that, online harassment to try to understand what somebody thinks. Uh, well, I, or, or what she was saying about the president Trump uh, being sent by God to save us from the Satanist pedophile Clintonians, you know, that that's uh, harassing these poor, um, poor Clint Clintons, you know, don't want to harass them. I don't know. I don't know why it's so opaque, but it's just, it's interesting that that Satanism kind of uh, fascination or uh, conspiracy theory is alive and well over on this rightish place mm -hmm. and then castigated from the left, but the left has its own, you know, with the trans kid thing. Like what is a trans kid? How do we know what a trans kid is? Like that, that's, uh, it's just such a magical, powerful word that's unassailable if you believe in it. If you believe in mm -hmm. it, it's not a conspiracy. It's, it's reality and it's child abuse not to believe the children. Yeah. And one of the, so I've been reading a couple of books about the satanic panic and the recovered memory movement. And one of the things that struck me the most is that the therapists and the clinicians involved are indoctrinated 
to believe that they have a clinical responsibility to believe every allegation. And even if the child recants, even if they say that they don't remember, even if they doubt it, like if it has once been expressed, it must be true. And you must like believe it, even if the patient doesn't and uphold it, even if the patient does it. And it was like, boy, that really sounds like when therapists and clinicians today talk about trans identity. And like, if a patient expresses doubts, if a patient says, well, maybe it's not right that the therapist has a, you know, a responsibility to the patient and to the movement to like, hold on to that identity for the patient. And we've just, we've seen that when we see, um, oh, I wish I could remember who it was, but people talking about like children being at a risk of losing their trans identity if they're not affirmed. Like that they would just grow out of it and forget about it. Which is bad. And that's a bad thing. <laughs> okay. And that that's really bad. And so adults okay. need to help them to retain this identity. Yeah. yeah, they've completely, they have completely lost touch with reality on this one. I mean, once you, I'm convinced that the, the trans child, well, the concept of the gender identity was sort of revived so that autogynophilia could be mm -hmm. hidden. Okay, so they're building up for this this rights movement and they know that they can't sell a fetish to the public. They can't base a rights a rights movement on on a fetish, a paraphilia. So they have this gender identity. Your gender soul is what makes you mm -hmm a man or a woman and it's innate and, and it cannot be changed. And the moment they did that, there had to be, there had to be trans children mm -hmm. because if it's innate, then there must be trans children. And the existence of trans children takes your attention away from what is mostly driving these men who identify as women, which is a paraphilia. So, I think if you've gone all in and you believe in the gender identities and you believe in the trans children, you've lost, you're, you're so far gone. You've lost touch with reality. You can't, I don't think you can see anything clearly if you're looking at things through that lens. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, I was speaking with a kind of a Washington insider, like somebody like literally in the deep state, just been a part of that, um, edifice uh, that controls the world and I was interviewing her for another project and we're part of an international organization and uh, she's really into the trans kid thing and saving the trans kid thing and making this organization that we have like accepting more affirming of this trans kid thing and it, we got to a, it was really difficult because I was just trying to interview her and not like actually you know yeah. start an argument or anything but that ideology just with the trans kid thing and this international organization with all these different cultures, like all these different cultures, Indonesia, Muslim countries, like the, the entire thing, everybody has to get on board with this. We need to change the organization and basically dismantle every other culture and their view mm -hmm. of gender because this is the right way. So this, this idea is it, it's universal and, and it's totalizing. It has to change any organization that accepts it. Everybody has to do the pronoun thing even if nobody has any issue with that we all have to be on board of it with it and, and so there's something unique about the gender thing that it that it can go so far beyond what these you know, adhd or autism uh over over diagnosis of all these other things even the satanic panic mm -hmm. it's a it's a huge i think it I, it sounds sort of I sound like I should be wearing a tinfoil hat at this point, but it's it was really truly orchestrated. You know, they really, a lot of things were done by stealth. They pushed through, this is not your average civil rights movement. I think we can all agree on that, that it wasn't done um, incrementally over decades with persuasion mm -hmm. and open discussion and debate. It was fully orchestrated behind the scenes and then just sort of thrust upon us while we weren't looking. And yes, we all have to, we all have to throw reality out the window and accept this new, completely incoherent 
nonsense version of reality in its place. And and because that well certainly we're in a situation here in Canada where it actually made it into law. They got they got gender identity written into law. So we're in a very difficult place now where we have this this completely made up concept written into our laws and we all have to pretend that it exists. But no, I think it was fully fully orchestrated on an international scale. And that does sound like I'm a crack, crackpot conspiracy theorist, but that is actually what happened. How do we how do we test that or falsify that or unfalsify that that claim? I know there there are uh, specifically I think Jennifer Bilek is has done a lot of research mm -hmm. on the international uh, level and the funding and stuff like that, and it's really convenient that there's this concept called anti-Semitism that crops up whenever you start talking about networks and stuff like that. So you can't talk about this. You can't you can't criticize people because they they have this identity that that it's very rare and precious and we need to not criticize anything that they do because it might lead to another holocaust or anything like that but how do we what are some of the things that you've seen that has led you to the conclusion that this is a intentional uh, conspiracy in the sense of outside you know in private people design this thing and then implemented it what are some of the good data points for that hypothesis? For me, it's it's where if you look, the trans kids, uh, or they appeared in various places or all, all over the world in the sort of in the media at around the same time. It was, you know, they've done all the work behind the scenes, and all of a sudden, in the sort of mid twenty tens early to mid 2010s trans kids are being thrust upon us in documentaries in, in newspaper articles uh, we've never heard of them before they've never existed before and it didn't just happen in one place and, and spiral out it happened in places in australia in england in the us in canada all at the same time which i find very suspicious you know and all of a sudden and around the same time, trans women are women, and what make what makes you a man or a woman is your your gendered soul, not your not your body. This is an idea that again came out of absolutely nowhere and appeared everywhere all at once. So someone was well, and of course the Denton document that mm -hmm. that we've seen, um, which is the international law firm advising NGOs around the world on how to get their sort of gender identity, self-ID policies. I think it was actually written how to get um, child transition, how to yeah. take the, the consent, right, from from the parents and, and, and let children consent to their transition. That was the purpose of the document. But it says things, it, it advises them, it's right there in it. Push it through by stealth. Tie, you know, self-ID is not going to be, not going to be popular, so tie it to gay marriage. Um, conversion therapy for gender identity might be a bit of a hard sell, so just tie it to a gay conversion therapy ban because everybody's against that. Mm -hmm. It's literally right there in the document. They're told, avoid debate, avoid media attention, because none of this is popular. As soon as we, we're seeing it now, no debate is over and we're having the debate. And it, it falls apart under the slightest scrutiny. And who was behind the Denton document? I, Denton's is an international law firm who's, who's um, I think they, they, they say they're the largest international mm -hmm. law firm. Yeah, law and, and lobbying. And I think they wrote it on behalf of, is it Iglio? It's the international... Gender youth law. Yeah, I'm not sure who something. was who they wrote it for. Um, James Kirkup wrote a wonderful piece about it years ago in the Spectator. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 well, that's a uh, uh, Mia's run out of battery. Uh oh. Uh oh. She might need to reconnect. Okay. 
Am I gone? Have I frozen? You're back. You're back. I'm yeah. I'm getting a my internet connection is unstable and keeps flashing up on the screen. Is it? Is the picture okay? Am I? Your picture is good. Frozen um, in some weird do you just grotesque just a thought. Because I think we missed most of what you said. I can't remember where I was. You see, this uh, is the problem. There was I, an article in The Spectator. I lose, I lose what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, uh, James Kirkup wrote the the article about the Denton document, and he takes quotes from it. The The document is available online. You can mm -hmm. read it. And it's, it is the trans activist playbook. It is their tactic. Massively successful in Canada. I mean, 2012, we got gender identity appearing in human rights codes. I don't, I don't think there was any debate, any media attention. Nobody, nobody even knew it was happening. No, and it, was all of a sudden it's an, in. it was hardly even in activist circles in that time. Exactly. No debate at all. You'd think given the, the massive impact it was going to have or could have had, or they at least could have foreseen yeah, that they would at least debate it, but no, they they did it all by stealth. Hmm. So I, yeah, sorry, Eliza, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say what I think the document exemplifies is what what me is talking about that we see all over the world, which is this kind of extra democratic insinuation of these ideas into like, like isn't there like the EU has a standard where you have to recognize like a kind of a gender recognition status, so. It, it's like there are all of these standards that nobody voted for and nobody debated on the floor of a legislature and they come out through medical bodies, they come out through like international human rights law bodies and they become the standards that countries strive to live up to, including, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting cases for gender identity is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, which is Malta, has, is like lifted up as this champion of like gender identity um, inclusion inclusion and uh, Malcolm Clark maybe you can link to this has some really great uh, threads about um, how gender identity came to pass in Malta it seems like a really good model for I mean it's just it's the playbook we see the playbook there mm -hmm. this is a place where women cannot get abortions even if their lives are on the line but they and, can and when transition. Did they, yeah. When did they get gender identity in there? Oh, it was early. I mean, I want to say it was like 2014 or 2015, but okay. we have to look at the thread. Hmm. But they've been celebrated as a world leader in um, in like trans rights for, for ages. And yeah. it's not exactly who I would want as the poster child of my very liberal democratic policy. So there's there's the there's the top down movement, but there's also kind of a within the elite. It seems the uh, the liberal progressive elite. There there's true believers there. Like it, it, they just mm -hmm. kind of accepted this idea. It doesn't seem like even that critically. If you look at uh, Jennifer Saki, I think, uh, the previous uh, Biden administration uh, press secretary, she was asked about trans kids and she got really teary. It was mm -hmm. a very emotional thing for her. And so it, there's there's the, the, the there's the bottom up movement, too, but it, it's coming from the elite, their hearts up there. Um, Within within the institutions, within the lawmaking bodies and stuff like that, there's just this proclivity to believe this idea, this set of ideas, because it it just rings true for them. And I think it might have to do with the academy and the academy's responsibility in uh, women's studies becoming gender studies and the uh, kind of that the queer theory kind of. Uh, being a very infectious set of ideas about ending gender and deconstructing gender as a rights movement, as a liberal uh, project or as an extension of the liberal project. Cause I, I see, you know, mm -hmm. college kids, you go and they get into this, they and, and more and more and more and more and more. But when I first came mm -hmm. across it about 10 years ago, I was in a bar eating a steak or whatever. And there was this kid behind me, these kid, these college kids behind me and this one 
very flamboyant gay kid was just going off about how we're going to live in a post-gender world and it's going to be so wonderful. And I got really angry. I'm like, you can't destroy that because of my bigotry. You know, I kind of like men and women uh, and Mm -hmm. the power that they bring to the table. Um, But so there's that too, the the college thing. And and that is not, I guess that's kind of top down, but it's still, people believe in it. People get into it. There's something about it that isn't, they aren't programmed intentionally. They, 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 the ideas themselves are just so infectious. I mean, spread. I think, I'm not sure that believe in it is quite the right word. Like the way that it seems to me is people who, ha- people who have certain identities are very susceptible to this ideology in effect because they can be ha- like your identity can open you up to a certain vulnerability to like being hacked by this ideology. So if you think of yourself as a progressive, if you think of yourself as a very sophisticated intellectual who totally understands queer theory, nobody totally understands queer theory. Um, in, a, in these cases, like you will kind of open the door, you will let this in, and then you will defend it quite ferociously, but without really understanding it. And that's part of where the ferocity comes from, because there's, with past actual civil rights movements or with, you know, what me and I do, you know, we're happy to talk about our ideas. We're happy to talk about and to expose ourselves to the ideas of our, you know, political opponents um, and feel, I think, a great deal of confidence and interest to talk about it. And when you talk about people who really buy into gender, they do not have that facility. And I think that they have, like, there is a brittleness to holding on to gender that, like, for everybody who buys into it at any level, like, if you transition and you need it to work, if you're a therapist and you need it to be okay that you did this to your patients, if you're a parent and you need it to be okay that you did it to your kid, if you're a progressive and you need it to be okay that you're supporting this, even though you're hearing some kind of concerning things about it, like, you have to shut down challenges and the cognitive dissonance that challenges bring up by not engaging. I mean, that's why we need, like, the movement needs no debate to survive and thrive politically, but also, like, individuals need no debate. Otherwise, it just becomes too dissonant and painful. I think, absolutely, but they... I think as well, they, they did it. They did a wonderful job of they they modelled it on gay rights. Well, obviously, they it's did. exactly like gay rights, and because they they launched right after the success of gay rights, I think it was a certain element of laziness. Okay, we'll just take the framework of gay rights that works so well, and mm-hmm. we'll just use it. And one part of that is. To, to equate anyone who questions the existence of a trans child, the identity mm-hmm. of a trans child, to equate them with the homophobes who couldn't accept a young person, a teenager coming out as gay. And because mm-hmm. we all have that natural, well, most of us have that natural instinct of not wanting to be labeled like the, the homophobes of the 80s. Nobody wants to be on that wrong side of history so they say i don't know the uh what was it the euphemistic treadmill of bigotry or or something like that where we were taught not to be sexist polite company is not sexist polite company is not racist polite company is not homophobic polite company is not transphobic so polite company is susceptible to being hacked by Mm -hmm. this moral argument this moral argument comes in We're going to stamp out oppression because we're polite. We're good people. We are the good people. We're here to save the world. And I think a lot of people felt like they had been slow to come around on gay marriage um, and they didn't want to be there again. So they'd rather be, you know, too fast, too far, um, too early. And that's a risk. And another is that I think. Oh, my thought just totally went out of my head. 
Well, and then yeah, and then absolutely. that goes to the next level on an institutional level. These uh, the universities are not going to hire you unless you prove you're a good person, right? You're not going to get a job in any media if you're not a good there's, person, right? Yeah, there's that, but there's also like you really do. You probably have kind of a sense that you shouldn't dig too deep into it. I think I think a lot of people do. I've had a lot of conversations where people, it's clear that they don't want to think it all the way through and maybe they have a feeling of where they would end up that they might end up on the wrong side of things if they thought it all the way through but i think one of the biggest kind of emotional levers that's getting pulled is that people really do like it does cause real pain to say no to people who are hurting even if what they're asking for isn't reasonable and i think that that hugely stills opposition and questioning and everything It's like there, yeah. is, there is real pain there. And again, I think it's we we want to fix suffering, and that's the medical model, you know, with the in the world of antidepressants and and sort of a, a medicalized psychiatry. If someone is suffering, let's fix that problem immediately in any way we can. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got no you see. <laughs> everyone suffers in puberty it's not a fun time it's not supposed to be a fun time of your life and the challenges you face and the struggles you go through hopefully you come out the end of it as a fully formed resilient person but if we're in the mindset that you cannot suffer and that nobody can mm -hmm. suffer including girls going through puberty or someone suffering from gender dysphoria like if we must fix that problem immediately to end their suffering right away we're not going to let them grow and develop as as human beings and so mm -hmm. i think it's this the attitude to suffering that, that that it's seen as a bad thing when it's just part of life and it's not necessarily a bad thing it's a chance to mm -hmm. grow and change the um the crossover with maids medical assistance and dying mm -hmm. so you guys can die at any time now it's like it's free actually even eliza like are you do you, are you on the canadian medical uh, i'm not train? so it might not actually be open no you can you, sure you can oversight. die they won't give you any help but they will kill okay. you okay Migrant no, workers can come up there. So it's, it's just, it's full access. But that is about, and, the, and I brought this up with my talk with Rupa uh, earlier this week, this concept of dignity, dying with dignity. Like who dies with dignity? You live with dignity. You suffer with dignity. Ending suffering is not a dignified act. And I understand that at the terminal illness, like mm -hmm. that if somebody is just being kept alive and their life is completely painful and they're going to, they're checking out, you know, within a certain time frame. like that makes sense. But now that it's being extended to mature minors and yeah. to um, mental health conditions and stuff, which can and just people vanish. people who are too poor, who have made the terrible poor. calculation that they're too poor to live. Yeah, the they're stuck. Like, You're right. Yeah. But that, that yeah. is still, it's still under the umbrella of ending suffering, of avoiding suffering. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of our culture, I, and I guess that is another tell of a decadent culture, is that we are we're afraid of pain and growth and actual change, like actual transformative change is hell, you know. And then when you get through that, you're a different person. At least in my experience, all the hard times that I've had. Yeah, I didn't get all the way through your conversation with Rupa yet. Um, I will. But I, I think the term that you used was like suicide affirming care, where it was like, this is your identity and this is your goal. And, you know, it's not our job as medical providers to challenge you. Like, it's it's quite a quite an unreal mindset to have that move into medicine. And it's like, OK, how did that happen? And I think like the conference that I attended and that Mia reported on. I. <laughs> I would be so curious to see conferences on assisted suicide and see if there was anything similar in the dynamic. But so much of the conference that um, that we witnessed uh, was how to get clinicians to overcome their discomfort, which means how to get them to overcome their clinical 
training and judgment. In what context were they supposed to get over their discomfort? Oh, I mean, in every, like, one of the core takeaways of WPATH to me was, like, if you feel some inner resistance to what a patient wants or is asking you for, that that is not a sign that you should look deeper. It's a sign that you need to, like, get over this barrier that you have this problem like it's your problem and it's your responsibility as a provider to like get over that and to use you know the power and authority that has been vested in you through your medical training through your certification through you know the high salary and prestige that you get in society and that you should exercise with extreme care and just to point that completely at the service of your patients who don't have medical training and are often really hurting and that seems to me a big it's just a really common, a thread in common. It's got to be like a standard manipulation tactic. Like, you know, this is your problem. Get over it. Like, oh, this is like abusive spouse dynamic. Kind of this thing. is abusive spouse. This is like cult indoctrination. Yeah. You're the problem. Yeah. The entire conference was just, I think they could have just, summed it up they could have gathered everyone in one room and said affirm believe your patients affirm everything that they say about themselves and give them whatever they want whatever medications or surgical interventions and yeah. that's it thanks for coming <laughs> that's, that's, it's basically the entire conference. And I, I loved it. I watched the interview, your analogy of the, the pit, mm -hmm. the pit at the center of the conference, Eliza. The, 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 well, that's where they, all the ethics, the question of ethics, it's sort of in, in this dark abyss at the, at the center of the I mean, conference. Just everything human, like everything that they should really ask themselves. It goes into they, this dark pit and they all avoid it. Exactly. And that's, that's the, that's the ideology. You can tell that every, I think because we're sort of late stage gender affirming care at this point where all of the, the moderates have probably jumped ship. All of the people over the yes. years who may have had their doubts, um, or sort of questioned it, they're, they're all gone now because we're into gender nullification area. We're into, Oh, the, those people with they, they now I came across them the other day. They want both sets of genitals by mm -hmm. genital. They call themselves Salmasians or something after some Greek mythology. I'm not sure. So, and this is to sort of, okay, I identify as both male and female. So I want both sets. And mm -hmm. the, the, there are surgeons who will provide that. So I think. If you're if you're in the if you're if you're still in there now you're one of the extremists and you're in the you're fully absorbed in this ideology so you can't even see the pit like the the pit is yeah. there but you're not you can't even see it you're so blinded yeah it was just unthinkable that anybody would ever ask a serious question in those sessions and indeed it never happened I, I think I missed, I didn't get all of the question times. I, okay. you know, I saw questions in the standards of care eight sessions and nothing else. So, um, of course, my favorite, well, my two favorites were the eunuch session and the plurals. Those were the two. Yeah. If you're there for the, for the madness of it, those, those two did not let, did not let me down. Yeah. So I think, we both saw something of those two sessions and then you kind of focused on children, right? So I think, I think that you saw a lot of things about kids that I didn't see. That's the, that was my main focus for sure. Just that the whole trans kid thing fascinates me. I think mm -hmm. that's where most of the harm is being done. And the the one the that caused all the trouble see when they they sort of had a bit of a meltdown over one of the articles that i wrote this was it was one of the i guess it was happening in one of the side rooms and it was a team of 
gender affirming healthcare providers for small children, well, children, prepubescent children. And they called them the littles, which I think don't think they, they, I think they think that's cute. I don't think they realize that that was a bit creepy to me because the only people I've heard calling children little, right. are the, you know, the ones who identify as uh, like the adult baby movement, the, the ones who I sort of have a fascination with children. And I think um, in the, in the new did movement, the dissociative identity disorder, I think they all call their child like alter, a child alter would be a little. Littles, yeah. But yeah, this this team were just it was so I didn't embellish anything in the article, you know. I didn't I didn't twist yeah. anyone's words. There was no defamation. It was just I just reported what they said, but that was obviously a problem because what they were saying was perhaps not what they wanted the world to hear. What were some but of I the things? I think the world isn't ready to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I, nothing. I mean, I, I did read the article before this conversation because it's been a long time. I write lots of articles and I, to jog my memory, I read it. And there is a, a little bit of snark in there that I don't recall putting in, but I was a bit snarky. Um, but, you know, they were just talking. They, they, they acknowledge right at the beginning that transgender medicine started with adults then it went mm. to adolescence and now it's we're in this brand new emerging exciting field with children so they did they, they acknowledge that there's a lot there's a lack of research and there are a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. and then they they're just talking that the whole message was being trans is not a pathology these children do not have any mental health issues. The pathology is the transphobia in the world that mm -hmm. they must deal with. That's why we need to give them mental health support if we give them any at all. And there's nothing, there's no preferred outcome, transgender or cisgender, no preferred outcome. And then you've got you know, they were saying there was one, he was a, a, a non-binary, they, them, and he worked in some outpatient clinic and he's just a kid. Yeah. And he was saying that because he's trans, all of the kids who come in with gender issues get sent towards him, get sent to him because he's trans. Not because he has any expertise, just because he has they, them pronouns. And he was saying that he he would give out he's not he's not qualified to give out medical advice but he would give out advice he would say you know I was talking to a mother just the other day and and she'd never heard of puberty blockers and I told her oh you can just have your kid take them and it's a pause and it gives them time to figure things mm -hmm. out and and the mother apparently was oh my god that's amazing thanks and he sees that as a good thing but. That's bad medical advice that he's not qualified to give and quite possibly altering the course of a child's life by doing it. So obviously I put that in and all sorts of, I don't know, they were, they, they were talking, they were talking about explaining puberty blockers and explaining infertility and all the stuff that would come to these small children as if that's a perfectly normal thing to do. And one of them had this joke where she would say to children, oh, you could be a, a you could be an endocrinologist when you grow up because you know a lot of cool stuff. And, it's, and, the, and the crowd laughed. And, and I just thought, you know, what exactly are you saying here? Like, you think a nine-year-old can understand the intricacies of the endocrine system? the future fertility that awaits them this is all this is all some sort of joke so it was it was all little tiny things like that that just added up into this mm -hmm. this is not uh, I, I don't know this is this is not medical care this is not you're not helping these children you've lost sight of how to help them and you're just it's just i think they were the ones who looked towards the pit of all the ones I saw in the conference, because they did say at one point, 
there's a lot we don't know and it's good to be able to get together and talk about mm -hmm. what we don't know. So there was a slight acknowledgement that we're just winging it here and hoping for the best. I mean, I would say that there were a lot of acknowledgements of we're just winging it or we're on the edge of medicine. Like those are both quotes that I heard, but <laughs> not with any, like, not with any seriousness -ness about it. Like it would be, this is something that Benjamin and I talked about um, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, but you know, they'll say that they're taking, they say that they don't want to talk about ages. They want to talk about stages. They want to talk about where kids are at and what they're capable of consenting to. And they'll pretend that they take it really, really, really seriously. And then they'll, you know, there will be an entire session that it says that it's about assessment for youth and adolescents. And at no point do any of the speakers, including on their slides, take assessment out of scare quotes. They're like assessment, like you want to assess them. And sometimes less assessment is better than more assessment. And you don't want to do too much assessment. And if they have autism, you know, maybe everybody says there should be more assessment, but autistic kids can know too. Or they'll say that they take it seriously and they'll talk about 13 year olds can consent to different things, but and have very different understandings of the future, but so do 30 year olds. And it's like, this mm -hmm. isn't the same thing where they'll say, talk about consenting to take puberty blockers or testosterone. And again, they'll seem to take it very seriously. And then they'll make jokes about like, well, the psychotic patient was allowed to consent to their stool softeners and their high blood pressure medication. So it's like, it's there and it's not like, they'll say, well, we're, we're winging it. And then they'll be like, well, there's no problem with winging it actually. Like. <laughs> I, I, don't, I forget which session it was in that they dismissed the autism, the high rates of autism with a, mm -hmm. a casual, oh, we're all a little neurodiverse, you know. Oh, I didn't just, hear that one. I think, I, I think it was Tishelman. I think it was in the child session so they're aware of it they're aware that there might be an issue with uh, the, the high rates of autism but yeah. we're all somewhat autistic uh, which uh, doesn't make any sense at all I, I do recall in the plurals that there was a new gender i, don't, I had never heard auti gender Autism yep, gender, gender was was thrown out there in the plural session. Yeah, <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> Anything's what's an a gender. Yeah, what's an autist gender? Is is, is it gendered? Mm. What was a? How how do you perform? I'm just gonna that look or, it up. Or recognize that. What is what is autism gender? Autistic yeah. gender? Goodness, no, I I don't know. Come. So queer undefined, which is a dictionary apparently, um, a term for when a person perceives that their experience of gender is influenced by their autism. For example, about if something about their gender is influenced by a special interest, a sensory experience, or a disconnect from neurotypical definitions of gender. Um, I can't wear sc scratchy sweaters. That's my therefore, gender. Right. Yeah, I mean, I went to a whole session on um, on working with kids with autism and it was really remarkable in that it showed how gender is treated as such an exception because the clinicians will show you know an insight and a familiarity with the literature of like children and adolescents and autism um and they would say you know autism for kids who have aut autism like puberty can be extra hard like the body changes can be that much more disturbing and like kind of the on ramping up of like a sexual drive can be even more disturbing than it is for, for kids who don't have autism. Um, and they would talk about kids being so, you know, kids with autism being very literal minded and like, don't use, you know, metaphors and things with them that they won't understand and confuse them. And then two minutes later, they would be using metaphors like, you know, born in the wrong body with autistic kids, or they would be reporting- Which they would take literally. Which they would take quite literally, and which we medicalize quite literally. Um, and they would take a case study of, it was like a 13-year-old girl, and you know, that girl has autism, girl hits puberty, girl really hates developing breasts and period, girl realizes she's a boy. And it's like, what were you just talking about? <laughs> and they, they would, the thing that they did in that session 
And there was nearly always something like this within a session where it would be like, where do we put the questions and doubts that people might have on some level? Like, what do we do with them to solve that problem for this session, for this topic? And mm. in the autism session, it was, okay, well, we're going to pin all of the questions and doubts that people might have on parents who are well-intentioned, but and who think that they understand their children and maybe they're concerned that it's just a special interest, but it's not, but they don't say why. And they don't say, you know, could it ever be a special interest? And they'll just say, you know, parents, they really have to, you know, parents have to overcome their discomfort. Parents have to expect, you know, expect that their kids, you know, have the capacity to understand this and that the kids have the capacity to distinguish the distress of, going through adolescence and the the differences that people with autism experience and that they can differentiate that from gender. And it's always, you know, it's kind of like it, it sets the climate in the room where you don't want to be the person who's like the parents. You don't want to be the person who's asking the, you know, the really uninformed questions. Because you'd be saying, I don't get it. They, they ask an all awful lot of parents uh, I find I saw that in the other session mm -hmm. where the one of the it was a Minnesota team of the, you know the one that the, the article that was caused such a stir and one of the one of the therapists was saying the parents have six months and that's it if at the end of six months they haven't got the pronouns right. One of her tips for how to get the mm -hmm. pronouns right was you have a pronoun jar. Every time you get the pronoun wrong, you put money in the jar. And at the end of it, you can use it to buy a binder. She actually said that. So it's this parents have to accept that their daughter is their son. That's it. It's it's on you to accept that. I'm freezing again, aren't no, I? No, Am I freezing okay. again? You're spotty, but I can fix it. I'm doing okay. You're doing, doing great. Okay, You're wonderful. Good. Yeah, this this idea as a parent, you know, I chose I carried my children inside me. I chose mm -hmm. their names. I I'm raising them. I nurse them when they're sick. I I know them. I know everything about them. The idea that one day I can just be told that my daughter is my son, I'm forbidden from using the name that I chose and that I love, and I have to use different pronouns, and, and I'm a bad parent if I don't do that. It's it, it, it's a really abuse of parents, and the fact that they are doing this, thinking that they are the good they are the good guys. Mia, yeah, is this the session where they talked about child protective services? Did they talk about child services? That was that was um, child. Was okay. that chi the child SOC eight? Wherever that was talked about, I wasn't able to attend that, and I was just I was curious what your take on that was. This is you can use child prote protective services to get the parents to affirm. Is this? Am I? It's been a little while since I since I watched all of these. Okay. I actually talked to Brett and uh, of Brett and Anna. So this is mm -hmm. um, the the daughter was in the cult, uh, w w was identifying as trans, and Brett, the mother, pulled her out of it, out of the the situation, and she desisted, and and she was happy. And and someone had called child protection services on her after the fact. They showed up at her house as a sort of, you know, and this is in Illinois, which I believe is a rather woke state. Mm -hmm. um, but she said once they were there, the child, the, the person who showed up was absolutely, you know, I am not concerned at all for your daughter. That I, I, I'm more concerned about you and that people have reported you. So I think their idea that you can use child services I guess it's just a threat that, you know, you can threaten parents yeah. with child services because on the human level, I think actual child services showing up at someone's house, I think they would have a hard time. I don't know. I, I, I always think people are, 
people will see it when they when you when you show up at someone's house you would see that this is not an abused child you would see that mm-hmm. this is not an abusive parent but the threat of it yes sure it's going to just like the threat of have a trans child or a dead child yeah but there's also this complete arbitrariness to it because it depends what social worker shows up on your door mm-hmm. it's true yeah. But with, yeah. with Brett and Anna, and I did interview them, it's one of my better interviews because it's just great to have a mother and a daughter um, on, on film together and uh, watch that interaction. But um, that was the internet mob basically swatting them. What yeah. you're talking about with WPATH is clinicians being taught to use CPS as a cudgel. Yeah. This is a whole other level. And, and these are, again, again, WPATH is setting the standards of care that people such as John Oliver and uh, John Stewart are mm-hmm. using to, to make their ramshackle pro-trans content, right? So these are, these are the experts, and these are what the experts are doing. And how long what? before Child Protective Services, in order to work in that unit, you do need to you know, be programmed mm-hmm. into this sort of, there's these trans kids, you have to be very aware that they're uh, at risk uh, over, you know, like a over, um, uh, over representation of suicide risk or something like that, right? So you need to be really careful and, and get them to safety and make sure that the parents obey this pronoun thing and get them get them bounded and get them drugged up Mm -hmm. so that they can have good lives i should imagine it's a profession that's easily captured too what was it uh, i think it was it julia mason who was saying pediatricians are the, the aap was so easily captured because pediatricians go into the field because they are that type of person they are yeah. they want to help children they care about children so sure yeah i guess child protection is another one that could be easily captured but then they should also be able to see the signs of a loving family i just i to me it's always so obvious that these ROGD parents, so for want of a better term, it's so obvious that they're loving parents, that they're not abusive parents, but that's because I'm not, again, I'm not blinded by ideology. I can see things clearly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's that interesting. Um, there was a, another groomer debate on Twitter, um, and there's some there's some nuance to have around that term, but somebody was... Uh, you know, entering into the debate and uh, because of the, there's a shooting now and everything's politicized. It's just so dangerous how people are politicizing Mm -hmm. all this stuff. But um, they brought up how, you know, every child is groomed into a heteronormative society. We're already, we're already grooming them. So why would we not groom them to be accepting of naked men reading them picture books, right? Like there's no difference between a naked man and you know any other body i'm mixing a couple of different instances but that grooming into a heteronormative society grooming into wearing clothes grooming into not wearing woman face and parading Mm -hmm. around with fake female genitalia which is what is happening at these things um under that that worldview and there was something that you guys were saying about um, like that, the ethical problem is always put somewhere else. It's like, it's the world, it's mm-hmm. the system of the world. It's that problem or it's the parents problem or it's my problem. Cause I have discomfort. So that ethical thing becomes to them in this upside down way. Ethics itself is hell, right? Ethics is evil. Like these questions are evil. It's like being mm-hmm. <laughs> like what is actually good is it becomes evil because they can't, they yeah, can't reconcile and, what they're doing. Yeah, they can't see what they're doing. And they also, and you can really see the effectiveness of this capture. Like, if you really believe, and I think that most people at WPATH really believe it, and it's sure repeated and enforced all the time. If you think that the options are affirmation or this patient will kill themselves, then any kind of intervention, no matter the risks, no matter the outcomes, is preferable. And that skews every calculation that any clinician, that any parent will make. And 
And I just, I think when it comes to trying to take down the kind of child medical transition industry, like the two pillars that we need to go after, the one is like the, the cooked suicide stats, like where we have good data, every, like every suicide is a tragedy. We should try to prevent that from happening to any, you know, any person, especially any child. But the, when we have good information, these kids are not more susceptible than other kids who have serious mental health issues, which is what gender dysphoria and transgender identity are for children. Um, and it's like, okay, we need to take apart that suicide myth and the way that it just incapacitates everybody and sidelines all reason and all consideration of risks. And the other one is that we need to take down the Dutch protocol and what that says and this was like a focus of the conference too, is, you know, this upholding this, this protocol for transitioning children. What the Dutch protocol says is there is a right way to do this. And there is a right group of kids to do this too. And I don't think either of those are true. The Dutch clinicians were there. Um, not all of them, but several of the big ones, they were presenting some longitudinal data, which is quite rare in this field. And I think that I've never seen people who were so incurious about what they were doing. It was like they were reporting on like cells in a Petri dish or something and not people. Hmm. And they're looking at, you know, over a range of, I think it was 10 or 15 years. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but how did, how did young people who had undergone, um, puberty suppression, cross-sex hormones, and often surgeries feel about their gender identities, their sexual orientation, and their loss of fertility that was built into that treatment model. And even the way that they report back on the data, there was just no, there was just no curiosity. And they, like they're reporting that about 40%, I think, of people regretted losing their fertility. And there was a large wow. percent of people who said, you know, I really wasn't qualified to make that decision when I was, you know, 12 to 15 years old, when I signed up for this. None of those kids at that time had considered it to be a priority. And at the time that, that they were revisited, 53% of them said like, okay, now I do want kids and maybe it does matter. Um, and this is, this is 53% of, they got less than half of the patients from the original cohort to follow up at all. So who knows? How um, many was it, How many were in the original cohort? It, was, it wasn't it even was like, very big to start off with. So this isn't the original right? cohort. It's a little bit down the road. I think it was about 205 okay. people. And it was right around 100 who responded to the follow-up. Okay. And I think that they were in their early 30s at the time that they were followed up with. And these were the ones for whom there was actual gatekeeping. The, 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 they were actually... Yeah, these are kids who transitioned at a very different time. Yeah. So they weren't being massively, like, culturally recruited into it. Um, that, that, that just shows what awaits us. If you've got regret yeah. of fertility loss in that cohort... In who, that cohort of... Much they more, had yeah. they were not so didn't they didn't they filter out if you were neurodiverse that you weren't allow mm, included no, or did there they were definitely there were definitely like kids with autism who were included okay. there was some controlling for comorbid mental health issues other than the mental health issue that is gender dysphoria which um, is not a mental health issue supposedly right. It was also a really, the presentation was also interesting because of the way that they, and I, it's impossible to know how intentional this was, but the way that they would make data, data that might have uncomfortable implications like unusable. So they're asking about kind of gender fluidity over time. That's how they frame it. And they lump together, they create two categories and they say, one is this person hung on to a binary trans identity. So they identify as a trans man at the start of the study, they identify as a trans man at the end. 
And then the other category is maybe they're non-binary, maybe they're gender fluid. Some people were like, I identify as an elf. I identify as, this is a real quote, a friendly, non-threatening woman. That's all it takes. Um, and people who detransitioned. And they put those people in one category so that you can't say this many people detransitioned. You can say this many people were gender fluid, which is a much more comfortable framework mm. for clinicians who have done irreversible things to children and then exported that around the world. What was that identity, that cool one about being a woman, non friendly, uh, non threatening? Friendly, non threatening woman. Non threatening woman. <laughs> FNTW. Is there a flag for that? Uh, if there's not, there I will think it's be. a red flag, like just solid red. Go <laughs> <laughs> <Good> on. <laughs> huh. Yeah. 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 The the uh, the outer myth that needs to be dismantled is this isn't happening to children. Yes. You still see that. You're like, wait, 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 what? Oh, well, no, 15 oh, year olds are getting less. a second. Oh, that's not a child. 15 is not a child. You're like, okay, 12 year olds are getting on puberty blockers. So it's fully reversible. Mm -hmm. They're n they're not children. Anymore. You know, it's just like, okay. Yeah. It wasn't Chase Strangio. Like you're not a child after the age of 12 or something. Therefore, Dude. no children are getting interventions. Although eight year olds are getting on puberty blockers. Chase go there. Chase is fascinating. Yeah. I, I admire that Chase doesn't block anybody. They just say what they say. That's true. They don't block you. It's a limited like, kind uh, of honor. What, what's his name? Jack Turbon. <laughs> he thinks everybody who disagrees with him is puberty, and he blocks him right away. It's blocked. <laughs> blocked. Blocked. Yeah. Blocked. So what's in the future for uh, both of yours uh, work in this area? Are you going to write a book? I know you're doing a dissertation, which is basically a book, Eliza, mm -hmm. a thesis or something like that. But what's on the forefront and what, what are you guys looking at now? Um, well, I'm, I am working on a thesis. I, I really do. I would like to write a book about um, kind of the, the online ecosystem in which this is all developed and also to really put back into context um, what's happening to girls and young women. So to put it back in the context of medical history and I mean, we have cut off the breasts and cut out the uterus and the ovaries and the cervixes of girls and women for all kinds of, under all kinds of different headings. And there have even been times in history where female patients themselves have clamored for these kinds of interventions, which is something that Bob Ostertag talks about in his in his really brilliant book, um, Sex, Science, and Self. And I think I think if I could write something that would put all of those pieces back together, that would be worth doing. But I also need to finish my thesis. And I and well, I do I have a not. Um, I just, I do have a big article coming about WPATH, so look for that soon. Where, where is it going to be published? Call it. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I see a book in my future, but I will, I will read yours when you've written it, Eliza, that sounds right up my alley. I am uh, i don't know. I, I don't, none of this has been planned for me. Mm -hmm. I feel that this this cultural force just pulled me along and has taken my life into this place where I'm a full-time salaried turf and I write, I get to cover, I'm right there, I get to cover everything, <laughs> all of the developments. It's, it's what I'm doing right now and I love it. Uh, the future, I, I can't even imagine. I could never have imagined myself being here. So, it's hard to even imagine where I'm going to end up. Yeah. What, what happens when you guys uh, run across something like that truly disturbs you? Does that happen? Or are you guys getting calloused? And if you do get like disturbed, how do you uh, work through that? 
Oh, I, get, well, I had to write about, like I was saying, the, the bi-genital, the Salmacian yeah. uh, group. There's a, I find it oddly, it's, it's very disturbing and it's very, because, because there are surgeons willing to, to go there. I just, I find it, it's an actual crime against humanity. But it's also oddly fascinating, just like Eliza, you talked about, um, the apotemnophiliacs, the the people who yeah. want limbs chopped off. I've spent a long time reading about those those people in the past because I yeah. find that fascinating. So even when it's really disturbing, it's oddly fascinating. Unless there are children involved. For me, when it's when it's children, and when I come across the stories of ROGD parents, that's what can send me sort of of spiraling and I get very emotional and angry and upset. What's the psychology? I I know this is just a theory or or speculation, but in these conferences where they're talking about doing these things to children, like what is, what is going on there? Do you get a sense of like why they're into that? Why that's such a burning thing that they're going to go the distance with this? There's got to be some sort of drive there. Beyond I, I, compassion, it just seems like if you're screwing around with children, you're there's something really messed up about you. I would think. Uh, but that's the thing, and you see them talking, and they look like good people, and I think they are. I, I think, I think it's one of those moments in history, a true mass psychosis. People have become detached from reality, and and. I don't I don't know. I people get upset when I refuse to call them evil. I, I still think most of them are well intentioned, even though they're committing terrible acts of evil. Because one of the the panel, the Minnesota panel, one of them actually did start crying when she was talking about why she does this and and these poor children that, you know, have to move mm-hmm. through the world with this terrible transphobia and we're there to help them because they're just children. And I think it's mm-hmm. just really, really misguided compassion. Yeah, I would agree with Mia that I think, I think most of the foot soldiers for this are good people and that their moral sensibility has been hijacked. They have been encouraged to (laughs) let the hijackers take over the controls. They have received a thorough, thorough kind of moral instruction in in self-doubt and in overcoming discomfort. And they see that as a sign that they are a good person. The more discomfort that they overcome, the better that they are as a clinician, the better that they are as a progressive. And I also just, I think Hmm. if you really if you really believe it, you will make it add up. You will say, if these kids will kill themselves otherwise, then any intervention, no matter how uncertain, no matter how experimental, no matter how risky, is worth trying. And you will think, and you will lose sight of the patient that's actually in front of you in a way that's just remarkably total. Like, a clinician falls under the same spell as a, a clinician who believes in gender identity will fall under the same spell as a patient who believes in gender identity. They will see the patient in front of them who is, you know, a 13 year old girl who hates her breasts and the attention that they bring or hates her period or is having trouble fitting in at school or is having trouble accepting her sexual orientation. And they will not see a 13 year old girl with all of these, this constellation of issues. They will see a boy who has an endocrine condition and a birth defect and needs chest masculization reconstruction surgery. And they are, I think that they are just blinded to the reality of what they're doing. And that was one of the things that made WPATH just such a surreal experience was that, was being there and knowing that in the future, it will be really hard to remember what this moment felt like because everything that to the people in this room feels imperative right now in the future it will be just as clear that it was wrong 
and everybody will try to forget that they were there. Well, this is it. I think that's the, people are not going to be out there apologizing and, oh my goodness, can't believe I did that. I think we're going to, people, we're just going to try and put it into the past, lock the door and never talk about it again. Yeah. There's, you must have read the, because multiple personality, the recovered memory movement and all that multiple personality and the satanic panic is such a good parallel. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the skeptics had written it, and it was quite scathing about the big names in, in the satanic panic. Have you seen it? Oh, it's when psychiatry battled the devil. Wait, when psychiatry what? Isn't it when psychiatry battled the devil? I'm not sure. I can't remember the title. It's been ages since I read it, but they, they show up, right? So he writes this scathing yeah. piece about the harm that was done and the, the key figures who, who, who fueled it. And then these guys show up, these doctors, to, to defend themselves. Yeah. Basically, one of them even says that he's not entirely convinced it was all fabricated. This is the satanic panic. He's not entirely mm -hmm. convinced it was all fabricated and perhaps real abuse happened, but it just wasn't as extreme as the memories mm -hmm. were were leading us to believe and even one Bennett Braun got got oh sued into oblivion he he says in his response that I wasn't I wasn't my decision to settle I was holding out because she actually said she created all the memories and it wasn't my fault and 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 it was my insurance company that decided to pay out and I don't know if it was him or if it was the other person who I don't remember his name, but there was a really nice, uh, uh, an explanation that made sense to me of, they were say, he was saying, you have to understand that I grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust and mm -hmm. the Holocaust, people did not believe that the Holocaust was happening. And so when, when this atrocity, this, this supposed yeah. atrocity came along, it felt like it was our responsibility as good therapists to not deny it and to believe the, the victims. It, it was a strange, nobody really said, yeah, we really screwed up, sorry. They were, they were still defending themselves. And that was 15 years later. Hmm. Yeah. So if we're lucky, this will be like that. I, th I see an end. I know you guys talked about it last time, but I see an end. I just think it has to end. The medical crime is so bad. It's so it's so obvious. As soon as the floodgates open and the detransitioners are visible for all to see, I think it has to end. I hope you're right. I think we have to proceed as though you are right for the possibility that you'll mm -hmm. be right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Godspeed. I don't know. It's just so in. It's just so up in the grill of culture. So we'll see. And I guess these things can just change on a dime. Maybe like one day everybody wakes up like, why was I wearing bell bottoms? And then they just kind of get in their <laughs> skinny jeans for the next ten years, right? So we'll see what happens. There's a lot riding on it, but. I think yeah. when I think when it's organic, it can just disappear as, as fast as it arrived. But when you've got a very mm. powerful, well-organized political movement driving it and silencing all opposition, it's going to. You see, I imagine the collapse to be sudden. I thought when everyone sees what, what I see, it's over. And I didn't see it. I, I didn't think Canada would do what we're doing, this sort of bubble. There was one more I read that, that we talked about triggering. I got triggered last night by that CTV article that I read. I was ruined my night. I made it all the way to the end. But it was just, you know, we've had the Guardian article, the New York Times article, like these left wing publications are realizing that something's not quite right about this gender affirming care for children. And then CTV just churned out all of the trans activist talking points, basically just dismissing all of the bills in the US as just anti-trans, basically pushing the suicide narrative and 
I don't know. It's just it was just an appalling article that it, it's like nothing has happened elsewhere in the world. <laughs> they're blocking it out and they're just churning out the trans activist propaganda. Well, you're churning out your own propaganda too. We, I'm churning out. Here time. we are. We're propagandizing right I now. Know. We're churning. We got to churn, churn, churn. I try to stick to the, 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 you want, you want to get, for me, I want to get the truth. Uh, just try and bring the developments elsewhere to Canadians. That's, mm -hmm. I, I really, I, I feel I'm lucky that I have the opportunity to report on everything that's going on elsewhere and all the detransition stories in the hope that, because that CTV article yesterday could very well be directly responsible for a number of very reluctant parents mm -hmm. who have these gender dysphoric children and they're, and they're at the gender clinic and they're not really sure. And then they read that on CTV and, okay, it's fine. I'll, I'll consent. I'll, let's do this because there's this body of evidence. And of course they appeal to, in the article, they appe appealed to WPATH and yeah. the AAP and and this appeal to authority. So I don't think we can win this until we can get the actual associations, the institutions to back down. We can't or create alternative uh, institutions. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of really talented professionals working to uh, get beyond transition, uh, get beyond the gender thing and provide actual care for uh, families and individuals and trans people and detrans people, you know, so. Yeah, I'm really excited to see um, when GETA comes out with their guidelines for working with kids. Yeah, GETA is like the anti, uh, or yeah, the anti WPATH uh, yeah. Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. I just uh, interviewed mm -hmm. Lisa Marciani of Lisa Marciano about that and there's a free webinar on December 3rd uh, to if anybody's interested in watching that but we had a conversation I think I behaved we'll see in the comments <laughs> I think you did <laughs> although Mia can I say that your accent is really delectable this is fast <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me. I'm going to end the recording now. You want to say goodbye to the audience? Okay. Bye. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was really nice to meet you finally. So nice to communicate in a f way other than text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go.